Hello folks, here we are again with uh, Victor and Laura, Food Forest Magic at Charles Street Gardens. Uh, Victor is going to talk a little bit about the peppers that he has grown and revived. Go ahead. So we're here now in my garden. This is um, Apricot 8. Mm -hmm. And what you're seeing here is 14 distinct varieties of pepper plants. Uh, unfortunately, some of the, the labels have uh, gone missing. Mm -hmm. a few of them I'm That's not, okay. I'm not sure of what we have, but I, they're all hot peppers. Every single one is a different type of hot pepper from a different part of the world. Mm -hmm. So what you see here is um, you got some little ones like this one here, which is an African pepper. It's called the Zimbabwe bird. It's uh, one of the hottest peppers you can eat in the world. And uh, that's basically what you get when you pull, when you have a ripe one. Wow, really that's hot. red. Yeah, really hot. Yeah. If you're not into eating hot food, you probably want to stay from, away from these kinds. Is that put into sauces? Yeah, or? you can dry it or you can make sauces with it. Or you can even cook with it whole and then pull the pepper out so you don't end up with uh, the mm -hmm. explosion of heat when you're eating your soup or whatever it happens to oh, be. Oh, wow. Okay. And some of these I bought because uh, one, I'd never grown before, and two, I thought it'd be kind of cool to just show all the different types from all around mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. So this guy here, this is actually called a Hawaiian sweet pot. It's from Hawaii. Just barely starting to put little peppers out, and it's supposed to have a, a sweet flavor, but with still with a lot of heat. And then you also have a few ones like uh, this one here. This is actually a, a Sonoran chilita bean, which is um, from the Sonoran Desert in Mexico. Mm. It's yet to produce any fruit, but these will probably be the smallest fruit that I'll get this year, smaller than a pinky nail. Really small, wow. super concentrated in heat. Um, I could barely even eat these because they're so hot. And then here's a, its cousin, which is more from southern Mexico, which is just chile de bean. Right? Same mm -hmm. kind of pepper, mm -hmm. grows in a different uh, part of Mexico. Have you eaten those? I've, uh, this is the second year in a row that I've grown this one. Super hot, but it's not as hot as this. its uh, northern cousin, because this one, uh, since it is a uh, in the Sonoran Desert, a lot more heat for some reason that creates the oil that makes your mouth burn. Right. So, and then you've got this beautiful one here, which is a purple pepper. It's from Ecuador. So you can kind of tell that I've kind of gone around the world as far as where the plants came from. And we have a cobra chili. And this is actually from, uh, if I remember correctly, this is a Vietnamese chili from Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Um, again, it's going to uh, be used more in Asian cooking, but this mm -hmm. is also a great drying pepper. You can dry this and then use it during the winter when, you're, when your pepper prices go way up. Right. So this is going to be one that we're just going to make chili wreaths with. And then here's something that's uh, kind of a whimsical one. Uh, <laughs> it's called a uh, New Mexico Twilight. And these ones start uh, this kind of this like, almost green color and they turn purple, and then from purple they turn orange, and then orange to red. So at any given time, you could have three or four different colors on the same plant. Whoa, and that's wow. that's the second or third year that, we, that I've grown that one just because of the color. Pretty yeah. neat. Yeah. Say, what's that plant behind you there that's with the purple flowers? Yeah, this is Mexican sage. Um, you can eat it, but for the most part it's mm -hmm. used, uh, at least in Mexico, a lot of the shamans and you know, people like that use it as uh, a dried herb and they burn it in incense and, and, or as part of rituals. Mm -hmm. What I found is um, it draws in a lot of beneficial insects like bees and moths. And mm -hmm. at the end of the season, when a lot of the flower sources start going away, this will be covered in bees. You'll have bumblebees wow. and honeybees wow. and even some of the little natives. Yeah, it's super drought tolerant too. Yeah. So mm -hmm. even though you water our tomatoes about once a week. Right. It can live, you know, he has to hack it back actually a lot. Yeah. Just, That's to, why uh, it, just to maintain the size. That's why this looks the way it does is because I've been cutting this back all summer and uh, usually once every other week because it grows really fast this time of the year. So um, now that we're starting to get towards the end of the season, I, I just won't cut it back. And it's, it's kind of like a final food source for our honeybees, mm -hmm. which we have over here. Back. Right, right, right. I, okay. I've mentioned that. Yeah. Oh. That was bad. <laughs> so 
So here's my tomato plants. Um, yeah. Let me check this out. So some of the same issues that were going on over in Laura's bed were happening right. here. We were yellow, really sick, a lot of infections. So we ended up doing the same thing. The same weekend that we started uh, treating her as we started treating mine. They all seem very green right now. And um, it completely turned them around. I mean, they weren't very tall like they are now. I've been harvesting. I mean, I've been taking buckets this size yeah. for the past wow. two months now. And, um, Amazing. Just to give you an example, this is a purple brandy wine. Let me see and that. It just came off of this plant about five or ten minutes ago. That's amazing. And um, this has kind of been an average size. I mean, like they mm -hmm. all have been this big. And uh, again, using the compost tea, mm -hmm. given like the first, like I said, first couple of weeks full strength, and then we kind of pulled it back after that. And we've been doing it every other week and diluting it down a little bit because the plants were really healthy. And then uh, right. alternating with sprays. So, we, you know, you can spray Neat. at full strength or you can do it yeah. 10 times yeah. and spray your plants. Incredible. Uh, again, the what is the uh, yellow tomato there well, in this, front? Well, this is also brandy wine. It just hasn't Oh, that's a brandy wine yet. too, huh? It hasn't ripened yet. And then I have Incredible. a mystery tomato that was mislabeled. Uh -huh. And it's been this guy here. Let's take a look at that, yeah. folks. Let's look at that and closely. And it's just completely mislabeled. It's supposed to be a Berkeley tie dye, but, but uh, it came I ended up with these, this one. and they're mm -hmm. kind of a, a sweet, uh, low acid tomato, something that you wouldn't want to make a sauce. Yeah, and they're all or, they're all heirloom. All heirloom. No yes. hybrid. And um, that is cool. Look at look I've at these tomatoes. A ton of tomatoes from that plant. Man. Now it seems I think it's starting to go away because. Mm -hmm. um, it produced way too many, way too fast, and the plant might just, uh, it just might have worn itself out. Mm -hmm. And then you've also got these really cool ones here. This is a Chinese heirloom, and it's called ZBU. And you get these really awesome striped uh, cherry types. You hold that up here? Let's see, yeah, yeah. You get these really pretty tomatoes. These are beautiful. Um, nothing like this, you know, that I've ever grown. This adds a lot, mm -hmm. a lot of nice color to a salad. Um, and they're also surprisingly good for making sauce. So uh, this is the second year I've tried growing these, and much more successful. Exceptional, this year. exceptional. Beautiful tomato. And yeah. then over here on the far corner, kind of going back to where my my family's from, we have a Zapotec, which is a uh, it's a pleated. A, yeah, it's a very pleated tomato. Oh it yeah, that's looks beautiful. Like an accordion. And these are really good for making salsas. If you, mm -hmm. if you like spicy salsas, right? these are the ones that you can do that. Um, it kind of lends like an authentic flavor. It's kind yeah, of that's a mild amazing. flavor. Some people don't like it. But <coughs> this is something that kind of balances it, you know, when you use it. It's a very balanced salsa. The other thing you can do is you can core these, and then you can mm -hmm. stuff them and then bake them in the oven. And, and do like a, a baked uh, tomato, you know, maybe like a slice of mozzarella, a little bit of basil, shot of olive oil, right. salt and pepper, really good stuff. And then the final one we have over here, again, I think it was a mislabeled tomato, it's a cherry, but this thing has given me so much tomato that I don't even know what to do with it. Yeah, this is a OSU purple, but um, they're yeah. not so purple, they're more red. They have purple streaks on the on the tops, but I mean, I've gotten hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these tomatoes. Oh, that's phenomenal! And um, it's still producing at a, an, just an incredible rate. Yeah, I I gotta say, this is just totally impressive. And uh, again, all these plants were really sick at the point of being pulled out. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the thing that I, I think everybody really wants to see how you can turn things around. So, uh, Victor, Laura. I want to thank both of you. Yeah, and, thank you. And uh, from Food Forest Magic here and Aquarian Solutions, here we are at Charles Street. Beautiful day.